I hate it when people look at my notes because it's got all my notes like, don't say this stupid thing. Oh, I, I'll pick it. Oh, that, that has like the family dinner on it. Okay, can I do this? Uh, next slide, please. Sure, if you want to. I'm just no. going to hit escape and start rummaging through your hard drive looking for the porn. <laughs> yeah, no Who point. wants to go look for porn on X's hard drive right now? <laughs> Actually, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Only two hands went <laughs> up. We're afraid. I have such a small. I have a. Okay, so I got the got this. OS 10 came out. You got to get the big hard drive. Um, about 10 seconds, and you're live. Whoa, sweet. <laughs> so anyway, there's the hard drive on this is so small. I can't put porn on it. <laughs> is that what's so small? Yeah. It's the, it's the hard drive. Yeah, it's the hard drive. <laughs> you want to sit down too? Okay. Got to answer questions. It's my people's. It's my team. Hey, actually, could you sit here too? And then we'll have like the whole posse up here, Christian. Except William, where is he? Uh, he's, he's, He's probably killing someone. He's a, he's a ninja. He's, he's with the uh, Haji net people. <laughs> yeah, he's killing people. So we're going to get started here. So I'm Jesse Krems, a.k.a. Agent X. You might know me from such things as DEF CON and the Hacker Foundation and being a, just a loud mouth. Um, this is Nick, Bruce, Christian. These people work with me on the board. Nick's co-founder. Bruce is just here because he wants to touch my butt. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to talk about what the foundation does, what the application process is, and the problems that, we can, that we, we're interested in tackling and thinking about. So what does the foundation do? It provides support, organizational services for technology projects that benefit people. And when we say benefit people, we're not meaning benefit just you. It's important that, you, that we're thinking about some other things and some of those spin-offs being we benefit people that are outside our community. Um, what happens, so we have 501c3 financial oversight status, or financial, 501c3 oversight for our projects, exempt status. This is why I have Nick, because he knows these things. Um, we do legal uh, support for operations. We don't bail you out if you're in the EFF, or if you get busted and you need to be busted out by the EFF. We do operational legal support. We look over your contracts, stuff like that. We do management support, so we're like, what's your goals, what you're going to do, what's your tasks? And we do marketing and sourcing, which means we price t-shirts and we look at uh, ways we can get your name out there. So some of the qualities that, we ha that hackers have that we think are useful to other people, and usually it's in the projects you do. You're all pretty comfortable with technology. Surprise, surprise. How'd that happen? Um, you're quick on the uptake. Something new comes out, you're, you're getting into it, you're interested in it. Unlike some geeks, who live at home, stay at home, and don't come out for cons. You're social geeks, so you actually have some awareness about the world around you and this idea of a hacker community. Um, and you have a certain rogue element. Certain rules don't apply to you, and you don't care. This is really wonderful. We love this. Um, and in general, it's a very creative bunch. Thank you. So the foundation is built around projects. And projects are pretty much the cornerstones and the building blocks of what uh, what, what everything we, we do is, everything's a project to us. We always say, what's a project? What's a project? Projects focus on specific parts of larger issues. So a project isn't, I want to eradicate evil in the world. We thought about that, but it's a little big. So pick out a choice part of that and make, pick, pick out evil and then find your bit of evil and then figure out, that, figure out what part of evil you want to take on. Um, projects have to meet the legal standards set forth by the IRS and they have to be approved by the board of directors and you know, meet, our stat meet our approval. Um, projects operate in the core spirit of the core values of the foundation. That means that they're sustainable. They're going to last longer than some of the projects we've seen or talked about. We want to see them lasting not a year, not two years, three years, four years, five years. And we want to see them grow, mature, and hopefully get their wings and leave us and maybe be their own nonprofit or business entity. We want, to, we want equal access for all. We're not trying to discriminate against anyone. So if you're going to say, we're just going to serve these people, we're going to say, <laughs> uh, we like collaborative development. We want you to work with other people developing tools, projects, technology. And we also want, to d want you to work with people that are going to end up using your tools in the end. When I start talking about a specific project, we'll talk a little about this. We want stuff that's innovation, innovative. We're young. We're hip. We want to see new things. We don't want to see old stuff. Old stuff is boring and lame. And we want something that's altruistic, that serves other people. Serving yourself, we could do that, but it's really not very useful. And the side benefit of benefiting other people 
is that we look good to them. CCC looks good to, to the general public because they do things that the general public benefits from. We haven't been known for doing that. We've been known for taking down Citibank. As a hypothetical example. No, no, remember how we got blamed for that, <laughs> that Russian dude who took like a penny out of everything? Evil hacker? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's us. Who are the you evil? Mean, you mean the hackers, not the Hacker Foundation. No, no, not the yeah, Hacker I Foundation. Was, Thank I God. So God. Was, I didn't catch that. Yeah, no, yeah, the Hacker Foundation. You clarify. Sorry. <laughs> As your so, lawyer, I recommend you be a little clearer, fuckwad. <laughs> Thank you. So this is a beginning of the project application flow. People have come up to me and going, so uh, this sounds really great. What am I going to do? I said, well, come to the talk at five. But why don't you observe a problem and get fired up about it? And this is not a problem that is like a flash in the pan problem like, ooh, this is stupid, but I don't want to but you don't think about it in two weeks, two months, two years. If you think about it every day or comes back to you over and over and over again, then it's a problem. It's a real problem that you can actually work on. Look for problems that benefit a lot of people, not a small group of people. When I say a lot, I mean like thousands and thousands. Think about stuff that's fixable with tech um, or that enhances knowledge transfer. You're probably not going to have a lot of you know, success doing technology work to mitigate the disaster or the problem that is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It's not really our forte. Um, grok the problem, really get in it, become the local expert, understand what's going on there. If you, if you are not the smartest person in the room about that issue, then bone up. And when, when I mean local expert, I don't mean you have to come to international conferences and be the smartest guy. But be the smartest guy in your town, or at least get all the books you can lay hands on. Figure out what part of that problem you're going to work on and uh, and go for that one little bit. Don't go for the whole sh shebang. So this is a global landmine map. This is an example of a big global problem. There are landmines in most every country uh, in the world that has had a major war in the last 75 years. So if you look at this, you'll see that there's a little, little country called Egypt right here. Egypt has the most mines of any nation in the world. And they were put there 50 years ago, not hidden on you, but by both the Axis and Allies during World War II. And the Egyptian government doesn't care because they're not in Cairo. They're not in the main part of the country. So they're floating around there in the desert. You're a tourist. You're a Bedouin. You're having a grand time out there in the desert, the sands. You're doing your whole Lawrence of Arabia. And you lose your leg. Um, to put that in perspective, how many people are in this room? About, what, 50? Not that many? 40. Okay, 2% of us are dead in the last day if we all step, if we all, if, if we all died today, 2% of us, that person would be, uh, would be from landmine deaths. Uh, in North America, where you notice we don't have a lot of landmine problems, one in 22,000 are injured from landmines. So it's a big national, international problem. Landmines, victims of landmines, prosthetics. Landmines are pretty bad. So what the, what the fuck are we going to do? We've got these landmines in the ground. They're hard to find. They explode. Deadly and dangerous. You've got to find them, you've got to track them, and you've got to remove them. All these problems have some major technological bend to them. So you've got to find them first off. Accidental human encounter is one of the number one ways you find a mine. It's also the really shitty way. Uh, you're going to lose a limb, you're going to die. Uh, these funny little shoes here were developed by Frog Design out of California for anti, from people that you know, disarm mines. So they don't, when they're walking into a minefield, you don't know, blow them up. That's technology in action there. Uh, this is the definition of a really bad job. Uh, it's going to be hot, really hot, because most mines are in the equatorial region. You're going to get down your hands and knees. You're going to have a meter wide swath, which is a little bigger than that. And you're going to probe every inch of the dirt looking for something that you're not supposed to poke because it might blow up. <laughs> These guys have a relatively low death rate, surprisingly. Uh, construction, construction workers kill themselves more often. But I, mean, I was talking to somebody here, and they were telling me about somebody they knew who used to disarm mines in the uh, Sion, uh, Sinai Desert. That was me. That was you. Thank you. Yeah, I worked with a guy good story. who used to be in the Israeli army, and uh, he was a, a weapons uh, demolition guy, and told stories about how they would be out there in the desert in 120 degrees wearing their full 
demining outfits. Uh, that is not a full demining outfit, by the way. Um, <laughs> That's the crappy people would, would get careless. They were removing anti-tank mines that weigh 70 pounds that typically you need uh, you know, two people to, to try and even just carry one of them. Um, part of their technique was once they did find them, and I, I guess they had maps, but they weren't very accurate, um, there were certain ones that had been booby-trapped, so if you tried to remove them... Actually, that's a built-in feature. That's standard. <laughs> well, not all of them had them activated, and uh, somebody got careless and just didn't want to take the time anymore. They were using these long poles to uh, get underneath it to sort of pry it up and out of the ground, and sure enough, the poor guy just, you know, turned into red mist and end of story. Right. So mining's really dangerous work, and this is the way you usually find them. Um, so the other very common way, and when I was doing research for this little presentation, I found many, many wonderful pictures of sheep, camels, horses, just blown up from mines. Uh, big problem because A, now you have a dead goat in a field that was going to feed you this winter, and two, um, you can't do anything, you know there's a minefield there, but what if the sheep are grazing there, or that's your new, pa or that's this, that's this area's pasture land. Geological movement, um, shifty, there's a lot of mines buried in the desert. You can find them in a couple ways. Uh, one of them is by them coming out of the sand dune and rolling onto the road. Uh, and plants, this is actually something new that's going on. This is an exa example of something we'd love to be involved with, but it's actually being developed by a private organization, uh, I believe from Sweden. Uh, yeah, the, it's, it's Thalecress, which, uh, which is this plant here, which they genetically engineered to turn red in the, uh, in the presence of NO2. And then they were smart, because unlike bringing kudzu to America and having it take over, they said, okay, we're also going to dwarf its ability to mutate and reproduce with other plants it finds. So you can just spread this stuff around, and what happens is you end up with these nice little red plants saying, don't fucking step on me. Um, then there's, this is a, this is the, mechanical detectors is pretty common, uh, metal detectors, a lot of landmines aren't metallic anymore. I was talking with a, a bomb expert from the FBI about mines, and I was like, well, we could develop a low cost metal detector, right? And he's like, we don't make mines out of metal anymore. I go, we haven't made, they haven't made mines that are met metallic, or have large metallic components in the last like 10 years or actually last 20 years. Uh, SPLICE is a project called Self-Powering Locator and Identifier of Concealed Equipment. Uh, it's a private uh, proprietary piece of equipment, but essentially what it does is it uses radio equipment, and, uh, radio waves, and when, the two, when the, there's a receiver coil and an antenna coil, and when the, when the, the panel sweeps over the um, a foreign object in a medium, It'll change the tone, and you know something's there. It could be a big rock, or it could be a mine. Robots. There's a couple robots out there used for detection, but it's fairly rare. Um, there's, not a lot of, there's not a lot of reason to do it, and it's very expensive. And remote imaging. There's new techniques being developed to find mines using remote, uh, like satellites. You just look at the soil and do spectrum, anal spectrum analysis. So you found some mines, and you're like, yeah, there's a mine right there. Sweet. Don't step on that. So you got to look it up. I went to try to find some mines on Google Earth. There's no minefields on Google Earth. You look around. It's really hard to get like good, up-to-date, global data GIS information about mine locations, um, or anything for that matter. This is somebody was speaking to me about um, asset tracking. Mines are an asset to somebody. So if you can find them, that would be great. These are, just some of the, these are just some of the small issues you're going to have to overcome just in doing a minefield search function. You need a clearly searchable geographic information system. It's got to have the right information in it. It's got to be localized so the people that are reading it can read it. And, you know, they don't have fiber everywhere, so it's got to be really low bandwidth. And then you've got to publish this information, build infrastructure to distribute that information. ICT, inf Information Communications Technology, is not very uh, well developed in a lot of places where there are a lot of mines. So publishing systems, uh, infrastructure systems to move that around, and then you've got to teach and train people to use it. 
all of these and most everything else I've talked about could be a project in the foundation. So let's talk about blowing shit up, because I like to do that. Uh, you can destroy them in place. That's pretty common. And when they destroy them in place, there's one of two ways they do it. They can literally blow it up where it is, or they get it out of the ground. They dig it up. They disarm it if they can. They dig it up, and they take it, and they put it in a big stockpile, and they blow it off. Or you uh, remove this. You, you, this is kind of a tricky picture to see. This is a rocket that's um, going to be fired across a minefield. It's going to tether a deck cord behind it. It's going to blow a meter-wide swath. Um, that, that's pretty good. Um, you'll notice there are some army guys here. Uh, who, is anyone here in the military or was in the military and wants to admit it? OK, one guy. Uh, the, uh, yeah, you have to. You know, choice. The um, US government only requires an 80% clearance rate for mines. So if, if you're ever in that position where they're like, we just cleared the minefield, go in. Tread lightly. Uh, follow the guy in front of you. Follow the guy in front of you. Now, the UN requires 99.6, which is much, much higher. Um, and a lot of the demining technology has been developed uh, by the military and, and brought down through like cost is through uh, is for military use. So it's not so it's not so hot as I like to say. I got a comment on that too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. Um, this is one of the reasons never to join the army. The the um, yeah, mine mine clearing sucks, and it's rarely done. That's the other thing that's kind of fascinating is we plant mines all the time. We planted mines. I think we planted some mines for Afghanistan. I know we did some for Iraq. We didn't really care where we put them. Chechnya, which didn't hadn't seen that much, that whole Serbian war didn't see that much action. Um, in terms of uh, mine lane during World War II, but it saw a lot re in the recent conflict, so they're digging mines out of there all the time right now. Um, they're still digging mines out of France, by the way, on the rate of two a day. Farmers run into them. They don't go off, or they do go off. Sometimes there's just a mustard gas canister, too. Those are always really good. So there's mechanical excavators that drive around. This is, just happens to be a, a, I think it's a, I think it's a Saracen unit. Um, so you sit in that little cab, and you whip the ground really hard, and it churns up the ground in front of you, and it blows up mines. Now, of course, one of the issues with this is that when a mine goes off, it's an explosive device. It lays out a lot of nasty chemicals into the ground, which then bleed into your groundwater. So that's another problem. But mines you're going to step on or slow groundwater problem. Pick one. Uh, robots. The robots are used a lot for things like this, where it's not a mine, it's a relatively tame object you can deal with. Um, this is actually a pack bot, I believe, made by the same people that make your Roomba. So if you have one of those. That's, that's confirmed. That, that is made by iRobot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so robots are incredibly cost prohibitive. Um, and mostly they're used for unexploded ordnance. I didn't initially, even when I thought about the landmine problem, I didn't even want to get involved with the whole unexploded ordnance issue. Because it was like, oh, that's a whole other batch, because you need to manipulate weird objects and blow them off. And literally, the first thing that bomb tech from the FBI said was, well, hey, guess what? That's not a choice. Because the other thing that gets dropped on a battlefield is bomblets, which are, and so, and those, I'll get to that in a second. But bomblets are really annoying because they don't go off. They just stay there. The other thing that's um, going on is, uh, a lot of technology self-deactivating mines. The idea is you can send a signal out and the mines turn themselves off. They're still in the ground. They're still full of explosives, but they don't go off. Now, who? Uh, so, you're buying munitions. You're the U.S. government. You're actually almost any government. You're buying munitions, bullets, bombs, mines. You can expect, and it's usually contracted, a 10% failure rate is acceptable. So you shoot the bullet, doesn't go off. Whatever. If you have a minefield with a thousand mines in it, and you have a ten percent failure rate, you got a shitload of mines in the field. They're still live, and that's a safe field. Go plant there. Here's some seeds. <laughs> yeah. 
So, and then there's a whole bunch of other issues, ways to get it. I, I saw an interesting little thing on eBay, which was this guy wanted to build a robot, a spider robot, with a laser. And it would walk out over the minefield, and it would detect mines, and it would shoot a laser through them and burn them out. Yes, and he wanted a million dollars for his idea. Yeah, 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 wonderful idea. So landmine issues, and this, this is one of the things that I keep seeing is that you get into one of these big issues and uh, you see, you get into other things. ICT is one that keeps coming up and I think is particularly applicable to our skill sets. Uh, building networks, building backbones, doing all that. A lot of these places don't have anything and if you get in on the ground floor, you get to be Ma Bell in wherever you're going to be. Uh, prosthetic limbs, you see a really big gamut of prosthetic limbs in the world. You see, you know, you basic, you're, you're walking on wooden crutches to stuff that's being developed out of MIT, which is a multi, multi-use, uh, below, the, below the knee amputation, or above the knee amputation leg. It's got uh, ferrofluid in it, so the knee swings at different rates depending on what you're doing. It does like 2,000 computational uh, you know, tests a second to make sure it's not going to kick you in the ass. <laughs> you know, and that's, I'm like, well, that's great. All of that, a lot of that high tech stuff is closed source. It's proprietary. And I'm fine with that. I had this, I was like, well, you know what we should do? We should get one of these limbs. We should get a bunch of really smart hardware hackers all in a room. We'll reverse engineer the thing, reverse engineer the thing, and open source it. Well, that, does, that doesn't help very much in the long run. So, but those are the kinds of things that, kind of could be useful and I think are tons of fun because I do want to build the bionic man. I'm getting older and you know eventually I'd like to be able to you know leap tall buildings with a single bound. Global awareness and education, getting the word out, it's uh, web publishing stuff, whatever. Policy change, this is uh, something that is big on a lot of people's horizons. Um, it's affecting national policy. It's not something we've been known to do. We don't go in and say, hey, it's a bad idea. Um, and then get into the whole side task of dealing with unexploded ordnance, which is another big ball of wax. Clip art. Uh, focus on the part that interests you. A lot of people are like, well, we're trying, this is cool, but I don't, care, I don't know what I want. I'm like, well, pick another problem. Find something that really grabs you, is interesting. You. If it's interesting to you, it supports your skill set, and your buddies think it's cool, you should do it. Um, if it's not if it's not of those things, don't don't get sucked into something that uh, you're not interested in. And here's just a big long list of problems that are affect everybody. I always top out with clean water. Y you go anywhere, there's never enough clean water. ICT, backhaul networks, phone networks. You can't run a country. You can't govern anything. You can't make a new civil society. You can't even have a civil society here if the power goes out. So doing that kind of stuff and, and communications control. Uh, local community technology support, one of the things the foundation does is it, uh, we're helping the noisy, the Boys and Girls Club of North Chicago with their programs. Um, and so, and that's something you can do in your local community. It's good local PR and it's easy to do. You're apply, you might already be doing it. Uh, transportation and engineering or energy. There's a lot of transportation problems. You might notice that peak oil is becoming kind of a topic and the price keeps going up and America's getting a little bit about that. that th th that's a whole bundle of wax there that you can just have tons of fun with and f make a lot of money. Now, we're not in that business, but it's, if you're the local uh, fuel cell expert, someone's going to come knocking eventually. Medical equipment. A lot of medical equipment that's used out there in the world, either in Africa or Louisiana, is fairly expensive and designed for a hospital environment. Well, if you need to, you know, administer drugs in the middle of the Sudan, you're not exactly in a hospital environment. And a lot of this stuff is really expensive, really over and under-engineered for the real world, um, and not reusable. There's been some really interesting work coming out of the medical com uh, out of MIT about just redesigning um, the whole system you use to deal with uh, diarrhea. It's a big problem. And there's no clean drinking water. You're gonna get diarrhea, and then you're gonna die. Um, low cost, low power, safe lighting. 
LED flashlights. Not, not that complicated. Most people uh, in the world, out there in the far off lands use kerosene lamps uh, or, or gas lamps. And one of the big problems is that they get the wrong gas in it and it blows up and it kills them. That's just stupid. So batteries, low cost lighting, and then non-for-profit training program. A lot of us need more tech training, but there's no environment for that to happen. And uh, there's a lot of for-profit tra training programs that you've probably been part of or seen. And we need to develop something that's not nearly as expensive. Textbooks and curriculum. I remember this great quote coming out of Katrina. There have been textbooks published in the last 20 years? Um, we're looking at massively underserved communities out there in the world, and you're looking at curriculums that are outdated. It's, it's, it's a fact of life. And the whole way the curriculum thing is structured is kind of awkward. And uh, it's, it's a, there's a lot of copy right there. And there's also just the literally the distribution of textbooks is archaic. Uh, transparent elect uh, electronic voting. Diebold can't get it right, but we trust them with our money. Um, we need to, and when I say we, I literally mean the hacker community, needs to come up with a voting system. Because if we can trust it, and we can manage to sell it to the, to the real world, it's actually going to work. Um, open source ambulatory assistance devices. Wheelchairs, uh, wheelchairs are proprietary. Wheelchair design is generally proprietary. Uh, the, I'm trying to remember the name of it, Dean Kamen's stair roving robot, very cool. It overcomes a lot of problems. It's really, really, really expensive. I've, I, I've bought all the automotive, all of my motorcycles cost less than one of those. <laughs> so uh, that's just one of the many problems out there. Free flow of information, uh, China, the Great Wall of China, big problem. There's lots of oppressive, there's lots of restrictive uh, countries out there that are just, they're, n they're not letting things go through, which is just stupid. Uh, humanitarian support, there's a lot of humanitarian agencies out there. Everything from, pretty much everything in the UN is really low tech and underfunded. Better. And so to why they're ineffectual sometimes. Uh, they need a lot of help. And that's actually where the Hacker Foundation really started out was we were like, oh, well, we could, we could help you know, people deliver food. That shouldn't be too hard. Three years later, we're not doing that yet, but we're working towards it. Uh, technology development thinking. The way we think about the way we develop technology as a society um, is ripe for a lot of new thinking. Reengineering for the real world, that's talking about like medical devices that are designed for a hospital environment, but not for the real world. Um, uh, Negroponte's big thing, low cost computing and support infrastructure. If we put all the computers out there, of course there'll be a big success. It's not happening that fast, and I doubt it's going to be a big success because there's no support infrastructure. AIDS and HIV, big problem. It's going to ravage it. It's ravaging Africa right now. You, if you pick up a newspaper, do a Google search for AIDS and Africa and a politician, and you will see the most horrendous, ignorant statements being made about medical care in a national scale that is astounding. So paperwork sucks, and we hate paperwork. Well, Nick doesn't hate paperwork. <laughs> I hate paperwork. So what we, did, what we wanted to do when we came up with the 501c3 uh, package, the, the uh, nonprofit in a box, was we, um, we did all the paperwork for you, and we created a structure and an administrative unit that helps you cut down on all this. So with that in mind, paperwork sucks, and we try to cut down on it. I hate paperwork, and I don't want you to have to do it. I'd rather have you do the work that you want to be doing. So we have an application form. It's pretty basic. It's very simple. Uh, it's going to ask you some somewhat probing questions. They're not overly, uh, they shouldn't make you bleed, but they should make you think about what you want to do in the long term and the short term. Uh, so you're going to fill out that, and you're going to send it to us, and we're going to, uh, we're going to look at that. The, pro the foundation has a project review committee. We're going to look at that. We're going to make sure your, your eyes, eyes are dotted, your T's are crossed, 
and you're, you're actually making coherent sentences and saying real things and have really good thinking behind this idea. Uh, they're going to review your application. They're going to make sure it's in order. And then it's going to go to the board. And then, like all things that involve paperwork, you're going to get to wait for a while. Uh, the board meets once a month. We look at, we look at the, the applications. We'll do, three thi we'll do one of three things. We'll either sanction it, and boom, you're a nonprofit, and you get many of the bennies that we already hit, talked about. We'll defer, which means we're going to request more information uh, because something's missing or there's some bit of controversy or question. Or we're going to reject it because it's a really bad idea and we don't want to be involved with it. <coughs> and then you have all of these things already set up for you and more to come as we grow and build. And that's about it. Does anybody have any questions? No, you're. Several countries, they, they don't even have homes. They still live in friggin' mud huts, and you're going to have to put a laptop in people's hands and throw up a Wi Fi access? Okay, no, that, that's, that's, this, is a, this is a discussion that's actually been going on for quite some time. I mean, we is, can is, is it, in America is, because we've, been, we've had reliable power right, for 100 right. years. We've had reliable cell phone service for 100 years. We can bitch about it here, but. Is it, is it water or computers? That, that's, the, that's the kind of the decision. It's not that anymore. The future is coming too fast. It's water and computers. There are a lot of, there are a lot of groups out there that do water, power, roads. Um, and you need a lot of other things to put together that whole package to create a modern civil society beyond um, you know, just water, power, and roads. And those are all bits of technology. Now, I don't know if there's a lot of road engineers in here. That's why I didn't put it on the list. I don't know if there's a lot of power engineers in here, but if there are, and we can help, that's a piece of technology we would like to deploy and we'd like to work on. Um, so it's, it's not one or the other, it's both, and it's, it's shooting with both barrels. And you're right, and that's one of the reasons I think that Negroponte's $100 laptop thing is not gonna work. It just seems like total bullshit. It's, like it, it's a nice idea, and maybe it's you know, the patented resume for legacy, but at the same point, I'm sitting here looking at it, and I'm like, you know, I have buddies that are in Iraq that are going around and like, yeah, you see the cities, but 90% of the country is still living in mud huts up in the middle of friggin' nowhere. Right. And it's like, and okay, well, yeah, that's a nice idea for the 12 million people who live in Baghdad and the lots and the surrounding communities, but, not, you know, 90% of the population of Iraq is not in the city centers of south in the desert. Right. And that's... Remember I said grand sweeping gestures? I don't want to tackle grand sweeping gestures. I want, I want you know, that, that's right. No, no, you're right. You're absolutely right. Grand, grand sweeping, I, I would love it if I could go, Iraq, no more war. Power works. Sewage system works. Roads, better than the ones we have here. is not saying much. Um, all of that, but I can't. I can. We can pick and choose our battles, and we can pick and choose which skill sets and time and energy we can apply to that problem. And there are bennies to us as a community and to us as an individual for that. And so yeah, and when, we, when Iraq blew up and right after the war, I was working with a couple people looking at what we could do in Basra. And Basra was relatively untouched by the war. It was not blown to shit. Unfortunately, it was dirt poor <coughs> because it had been, you know, essentially underfunded by Saddam's regime because they told him to, that he was a dick. Of course, uh, Saddam wanted his 53rd palace instead of actually his right. well, own Well, exactly. And, you know, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of governments and systems out there that are like that. That being said, so you went into, you, we looked at specifically at the University of Basra. What could we do to help the people in Basra get up to speed and move from being, oh shit, we've just been invaded by these guys, um, which makes everyone feel really uncomfortable, to gain back to their normal life. And so Basra has a huge student population. The University of Basra is one of the best universities there. But it's underfunded, undersupplied, and under, under, uh, 
underfunded, undersupplied, and, and basically everyone's out of date. They haven't been able to travel. The professors aren't very well trained. There's tons of things you can do to put a university together in a relatively short amount of time. Those are the types of things that we can help with. And that, that's one of the ways that, so that's one little problem that affects a small group. Yes? I, I have a question in three parts. Oh, jeez. OK, OK, you got to give them to me one at a time. One at a time. That's Because somebody else got a two-part question. It's hard. Oh, oh. Three parts. I can write them down on your notes. No, no, just okay. tell me. Um, first, what's kind of the current status of the Hacker Foundation? Uh, we're, we're in like a permanent startup stage right now. Yep. That's what I feel like. Um, we have our 501c3 status. We have our board of directors. We're building up our internal capacity. Yeah, don't let them see my dinner photos. Um, uh, and we have a couple projects on the books, and we're talking to a couple other projects. What, what projects are on the books? I was going to check. Okay. Can we talk about them? No. No, okay. I can't talk about one of them that's really cool. Uh, Actually, at this at this <coughs> at this juncture, at this point, since we haven't since we haven't finalized the arrangements, the finances, uh, we've been advised to not talk about it or publicly disclose them. But that one, or what about that other one that I talked about earlier? Which one? The Boys and Girls Club. The Boys and Girls Club of Chicago. Yeah, the, okay, we can talk about yeah, that. That's simple. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's a support role. Thing. So yeah, we, we're. That's a non-answer. That's a non-answer. I'm sorry. Well, that's all right. I'm but, just we, go, yeah. but we're working on it. I, mean, I didn't know if there were like already projects underway. <laughs> there or? are a couple. Um, yeah. And we, we, almost everybody on the board had a bunch of projects they want to do. And we've all tabled them because we're working towards what the foundation is, is getting set up to do. And projects that come into us. Right. So, that's so, so, yeah. so, so um, what we need is volunteers. Right. We need some money. Uh, money always helps. And mostly the money is for building up our own internal capacity. Um, you know, business cards, banners, money to make money, um, money to run administration, which is really boring. Uh, so those are the two, volunteers and money. So that was question number two, actually. So you did a good job of looking at the future of what you guys needed. Um, so that's why I'm the president. That's awesome, man. Hail to the chief. So the, the third question, um, it turns, I mean, the open source community, um, has this habit of reinventing the wheel every three and a half seconds. Yes. Um, you know, where we're all trying to do like, hey, let's make a new graphical interface for Linux or whatever. Um, and we get 100,000 people spun up on a problem and then another 100,000 people solve it differently. Um, do you guys have plans to make like a clearinghouse and say, here's all the stuff that's kind of on the table. Uh, you know, we're already thinking about, you know, clean water in Zambia and, you know, roads here and this other thing. So if you're thinking about doing something similar, Let's Give us a call. Glom together a little bit so we can determine if there's critical mass or not. Because it's one thing to have somebody come up and fill out an application and be like, "Yeah, brother, I'm going to go build a road to you know wherever." Timbuktu. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but sure. it's quite another to have you know 55 people say we're all into road building and we all want to work together. You know how we talked about that yesterday? Yeah. It's okay. Yeah, I, I rolled that into the website. Okay. It, it's in my mental website. Um, <laughs> What's the link for that? It's, it, it, you're going to get it for some point. Yeah. And that, well, there's two things there. You know how I talked about getting fired up for projects that are long? Right. Um, people, it was so funny. I remember this kid going, dude, I just made my own Linux. See, I got this book, and it was like the Minix book. I was like, well, great. But can I surf the web on it? No. Can I put it on my computer? No. Well, it's not doing me much good. Why don't you run Linux? Just normal Linux instead. And so and that's the kind of stuff that, we're, we're working towards dealing with it. It's sustainability. It, it's got to be long term, and it's got to grow itself over the long period. So we're, we do we we're taking a very long view with the projects we try to take on. Does that answer your question? I guess the question is: Is there a plan to provide some kind of? Uh, so in your mental website, yes, there is something that says here we can get a bunch of people together oh. such a jam on this. Yeah. The actual website will have that. Yes. And that's still in the process of being redesigned. Do you need website development help as well? Well, that's what volunteers are. Well, that's what I'm saying. I mean, with volunteers is a broad swath. Like, okay. brother, I can mow lawns, but I can't do a lot of other things. But I hazard to say you don't need lawns mowed. You need, like, websites to can you get us? Can you get us a cut of the money? You're yeah. really good at mowing <laughs> lawns. Sweet. General point. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, every, every um, we have to have great at building bookcases, though. Oh, uh, let's not go there. <laughs> it so needed. Is, is, this, is this just strictly international, or is it domestic, too? It's actually the 501c3 thing. That's domestic. That's the annoying part. But there's no so international. Wait a second, let me do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
501c3 status allows U.S. entities and U.S. taxpayers to donate money to to donate money to a 501c3 organization <coughs> and write off that donation against their federal tax liability, um, their their AGI or you know their gross their net um, on their taxes, and then once you know, once the 501c3 has the money, it's their responsibility to prove to the IRS that they're using it for exempt purposes. Now, as long as we, as long as the 501c3 stays out of certain countries under certain circumstances, you can perform humanitarian service wherever you want, um, but you can use that money for any exempt purpose anywhere in the world under the case guide, under the case law guidelines right now. There are some restrictions, but if you're trying to provide clean water to people that don't have it, the IRS is not going to have a problem with you spending exempt money is when you're serving a humanitarian purpose or when you're serving an open purpose. The thing that they don't like is when you spend money on things that you said you weren't going to spend money on or spend money on things that you haven't disclosed that you're spending money on. That The 501c3 status sets up a lot of checks and balances. The public can come in and look and see and make sure that what you're doing exactly what you're saying you're doing, um, that your books are more or less open, and that you're serving the public interest. Yeah, there are a lot of 501c3 um, organizations out there that are perpetuating fraud. The IRS clamps down on them; they revoke status. Um, but you know, it's it's not something where are you spending the money? The question is how are you spending the money, and that's the overriding concern. So whether you're doing it domestically or internationally, it depends on what the purpose is that you're doing. Well, I guess I, I was just asking because obviously. That's the same problem. That's what's so cool about that. Do you, do you cover things like that domestically? Yeah. Like no, no, that. Projects well, Iraq or well, this is that is the same problem whether it's here or it's there. Um, you know, you look at you look at, uh, and I really don't want to sound like I'm pooping in, on Alabama here, but um, Alabama has a lot of problems, and it's funny because a lot of uh, domestic domestic humanitarian groups that do crisis stuff train in Alabama because it looks a lot like places they're going to go in terms of the level of infrastructure um, and the density of the population and the ability to actually d just practice there. Uh, if you are doing, if you're, get, if you're figuring out how to roll out high speed to Alabama, or in my case, I live in Vermont, we're doing the same thing. That's the same problem as doing it in Chechnya. And if we can make that a package, a module that we can export, all the better. And if we can say we did it, even better. So does that, do you see what I'm getting what at? You say not only can you fund international, oh. but you also try, try to fund and support domestic efforts too. Uh, my best friend was poisoned by his well because it was not clean. Clean water is an issue here. When I, when I looked at all those problems, they're global problems to me. So. Oh, they're in my backyard. And, and that's one of the things that we try to resolve in the application process. When you, um, when you come to the Hacker Foundation, when we're talking about what it is you're doing, trying to pin down things like that, you may have a very specific, narrow focus. You know, you may be thinking about clean water in terms of the friend, your friend that got poisoned in the well. You may be thinking about services that you're developing and code you're writing to solve a specific problem that you think might have applications elsewhere. What we, one of the things that we try to do in addition to getting exempt status is seeing, well, what other projects can you help? Where, what are the other applications of the tool you're using? You know, is this something that's going to solve a very temporary problem that is not, perhaps not going to serve the focus that you thought it was going to serve? Or is it something that can contribute to things that are being developed? Is it a way that we can, you know, turn what you think might be a local problem into a global solution? Right. And the other... Right. Right. Um, the one of the other things we don't, we actually, I, I try not to say what we don't do. One of the things we, we don't do right now is disaster response because you have to be ready for the disaster and it's pretty hard to do, do good ad hoc response. Um, we've seen, I was really impressed by a lot of stuff in terms of tech, uh, by like people like the Prometheus Project, et cetera, et cetera, um, about what they did in Houston with the radios. Um, there, there was roadblocks put in their way. 
the, I think it was the Astrodome said, you need to have a radio for every family, which was ludicrous. You don't need a radio. Not every family needs a radio. We need to hook into the PA system and broadcast it, and then when we get radios, hand them out equally, but you know, one for every four families or whatnot. Um, but FEMA was very strict. One radio for everybody. That's how we work here. So they did it. They called Sony and said, we need 10,000 radios, and we need them here tomorrow. And Sony said, there you go. Um, and that's all, well, that's all well and good, but it expends a lot of energy on some very short-term um, problem that is a problem that wasn't there is not a real long-term problem. So we're really. That's a project right there, sir. <laughs> that, no, the, somebody came in and was like, "I do asset." Now you're talking logistics, and oh, holy hell! Uh, that's, a, that, um, that, that's a logistics as a whole. I mean, there's whole companies that do nothing more than move things from one place to the other. Yeah, exactly. Uh, strangely enough, did some research on logistics software, tracking stuff, finding things. There's no open source logistics software. Um, yeah, we say that a lot, actually. Open source. Open source. Um, but that's, the, uh, that's a whole problem right there, too. We don't, there's this other category of things we do that is still being developed. Logistics, and that was kind of like marketing. That was actually one of the things I saw in the marketing thing is we do a lot of t-shirt pricing for people. They, they, they should be able to do it for themselves, but it takes a certain amount of savvy. And logistics is one of those things. Once you get good at that stuff, that's a skill you can repeat and repeat. If we had a whole team of people here, that are hackers all about hacking the logistics system of the world. That's a great asset. We can go, we can go to other nonprofits and say, hey, we got these guys. They know what they're doing. You want, you, you want in on this? You want to trade some resources here? You want to grow? We're hackers, by the way, not criminals. Um, so yeah. Any more questions? Anybody? Yes? You mentioned the uh, Boys and Girls Club. Mm -hmm. Have you guys gotten into public schools at all? Not yet. Not yet. I, I don't think we couldn't. This is kind of like a pilot project, so um, you know we'll, we'll be able to gauge better how to uh, work with other organizations like that based on the level of success we have with this. So but yeah, um, no, nothing is out of the realm of possibility. Right. I, I don't and, know. And I, I have to emphasize that a lot. We're not here saying this is what we're interested in and this is what we're doing. It's the reason the foundation exists is to allow what you is to allow you to do what you're interested in and do it better and do it with more people and find people who are doing similar or comparable or compatible things. You know, if you're interested in something that we haven't mentioned, we want to help you try to do that if it serves an exempt purpose. We at least want to hear about it. I mean, all, all <laughs> of these things that we're throwing out are, um, are ideas, some of which are in active development, some of which we've just thought would be nice if we get the interest there. If there's an interest level somewhere else, we want to know about it so that we can help you do that. So um, I think what's interesting with that is that, um, you know, as the hacker scene kind of self-organizes anyway, I mean, there's been a couple talks already this weekend about, you know, here's how to run a successful hacker group or, you know, things that have worked and all the problems we've had and whatever. Um, and if you think about, you know, if you spent a quarter of that energy bitching and moaning and partying, you know, doing something for the greater good, we could, as a community, accomplish a lot of stuff. Um, you know, that was kind of, um, I know when I started the Spoo Group, that was one of the goals that I had, is just rope some people together and try to do more as a group than we could as individuals, and we've tried to do it kind of altruistically and whatever, but it was very, you know, security focused, if you will, not at some of these greater humanitarian projects. And, you know, we have 30 odd people, and we've been able to do quite a bit without expending, you know, a serious ton of energy. It's been a few people contribute, and then a few others, and whatever. And as long Many as pieces loosely joined. Yeah, exactly. That kind of exactly. like how the internet works. Yeah, yeah. yeah you go. It's cool like that. So you know, uh, that's why I think it's outstanding about the Hacker Foundation is that you know now we've got a target um, with respect to humanitarian uh, issues and some of the greater good uh, projects. And you know, as a community, we we tend to form around the around common goals anyway. And I think it's just a new common goal. Like it's you know. It, we're getting older. We're reproducing, having kids, becoming domesticated. Um, you know, you go to, yeah, you go to DEFCON now, and they have all these kids' T-shirts and things, and the onesies and everything, and they're sold out by the second day because all the hackers have reproduced and are buying hacker gear for their kids. Um, so clearly, there's some sense of like, you know, hey, that is so sure. creepy, creepy. <laughs> yeah, we're, yeah, we're we're maturing, and we gotta, you know, we gotta like do fine wine, like, like fine wine. Like 
I mean, we are legacy, or we're leaving? Okay. We're good. Uh, we well, no, no, that's that's totally true. And that was the thing that I mean, what irked me for a long time is people were like, "Oh, hackers! They don't do anything but break into stuff." And I was like, "Well." And party. And party, yeah. which is fine when you're 21, um, but when you're when you're 35 or older, it's you know it's like Mick Jagger. That's creepy. It's like a skeleton with leather on on stage. You know, there's a certain time when you gotta be, you gotta become an adult, and that's uh, and that's one of the things that and part of that is giving back, and those people will reciprocate it. And it's pretty weird, actually. I'm, I'm, I'm often surprised. I'm like, hey, let me help you fix your computer. No reason why I'm doing this other than boop, boop. And I do my little thing. And they're like, wow, that's great. And it just spreads and spreads and spreads and spreads. And then I'm like the nonprofit computer guy. And I'm really busy all of a sudden, which is another issue. But that, you, that's, you, choose, you, choose, you, you choose what you want to do. Any more questions? Anybody? Anybody? In the back. Oh, all the way in the back, yes. Uh, like, what would you, like, if I ask if they enumerate, like, the, uh, the two most important things in, like, the next two months for Hacker Foundation? God, this is like, what would they be? this is like one of our board meetings. <laughs> <laughs> what are our goals for the next two months? Um, um, I, he's, he wants to answer. Yeah, I'm going to take that. Okay. Uh, a lot of it's internal right now because we're setting up uh, donation mechanisms for our projects, and we're setting up a lot of the diligence things over, I guess, the most important thing we need to do over the next two months is make sure that the projects that are on board that we're supporting have everything there to make sure that we have all the requisite documentation so that they know what um, our expectations of them are and we know what their expectations of us are and to work out and officially formalize those systems and get those going so that they can start living under exempt status and that's on the verge of happening right now it's close enough so that in the next two months we'll be able to talk about it and two two really big profile really major profile projects will come out as hacker foundation projects in the next two months um, you know our secondary goal is figuring out who's out there who has projects who wants to take advantage of a lot of the things offered by exempt status networking with them and you know launching them as uh, you know five new 501c3 projects within the auspices of the hacker foundation those are the two I mean the two goals that I see operationally right now and a lot of that is the work that I'm doing a lot of that is the work that the vice president's doing um, out in San Francisco and we've added another board member Jake Applebaum who just moved to Toronto and Canada and the three of us are are working on that right now does that answer your question and we're also finding our message. Sounds, we're finding our voice. Um, we don't know how well this sells to people yet. We haven't done a lot of these where we get up and say, sustainability, equality, go serve the greater good. Um, you know, that's different than saying, dude, dude, I'm going to show you how to pwn the NSA. It's, you know, um, and those are different things. And so and it's, a, it's not a discussion we always have. You know, we're, we're talking about fucking shit up and drinking beer. Yes, sir. Yes. You do have day jobs. Uh, yes, unfortunately. I have a horrible day job. I'm sure. It's sort of like T-Mobile evening and weekend. When do you think you'd be able to donate all of your time or, or, you know, I guess get enough money out of this so that you guys could work 100%? Well, let, me, let me think. Of two when can you... Yeah, no, I, I got to check with the accountant. Yeah. Two million? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I would, I would, I'm just wondering. I, you know, that I, I, the thing is, is that I don't think anybody in the Hacker Foundation is shooting for us to be able to leave our day jobs and work on this full time. Because, right. for, you know, we don't want to draw salaries and draw money from the community so that we can pay ourselves to work on it full time. That's money that projects need to buy computers. That's money projects need to have conventions. And I don't see, I, I don't really see a full time staff or having even you know, a one or two percent administrative overhead. You know, a lot of these really, really big charities Red Cross spend 10, 15 percent of their donation money on administrative stuff, which I think is incredibly wasteful. So I, 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 I want you guys to make salary. Yeah. I disagree. Yeah. I want you guys to make a salary. I want you guys to work full time doing what you're doing because 
Sweet. Well, I need you guys to do that. I need you guys to fill that role. I'm like, thank God someone's thinking about that. Good. Yeah. You should do that all the time. I think that your your value as a community and to everyone is better suited to what you're doing now than whatever you know owning you're doing elsewhere. So, <laughs> well, that feels. I'm not saying that is value. Right. Does, I mean, does anyone else think this is a good idea? <laughs> Um, well, that you know that one voice is really nice to hear because we're like, mm, I hope they like this idea. <laughs> um, well, and, and the thing is, we you know, especially over the past couple months as we've been working these projects, they've become full-time jobs in and of themselves. On top of my accounting job, which this time of year is very interesting. You know, very very. He was doing taxes last night, by the way. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah. I, I, I went from the uh, I, I went from the NY 2600 party. Back up to my room to go finish some tax returns for people that I should have finished before I left from here, but that's that's another story. Uh, yeah. And you know, we, my goal, you know, a lot of people go into charity and think, oh, well, I'm going to end up doing this full time, get a lot of money, and do that. That's not really on the radar of anybody at the Hacker Foundation right now. I mean, I, ideally, it'd be nice if we found some people, mostly retirees, you know, who could work on it full time and treat it like a full time job, but not draw a full time salary for it. That the only thing really holding us back from that is the fact that we think that any money that we would be spending on administrative overhead is better spent elsewhere. Yeah, we're very much in big barter. That's what I want you to think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're very much in big barter and steel mode right now. But we like it. It keeps us young and lean. To point out that you know what we have here, this representation representation of the the core values hmm? that we feel that the Hacker Foundation. Um, right. Should be purporting. I mean, altruism. That's really what it is. We don't do this with the expectation of, you know, making money. We're just trying to help make things better. Yeah. So we're getting the can yo can I dudes. Just that one quick question. No, we'll talk to him later. <laughs> I've talked to him all weekend. No. Okay. What's uh, quick? Quick. Hacker Foundation. Who does Hacker Foundation want to collaborate with? Like, I have a very long list. I'll show it to you. Okay. The short answer is everybody, everybody buddy. who will collaborate <laughs> with us. Except that guy. No. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. I think the part where you talk went well. <laughs>